So this is kind of a weird chapter. It, it's a very definite split in the material. Like we spent the first 10 weeks or whatever doing one thing. Now we're doing something else. I mean, we are going to still be working with vectors and matrices, but we're now going to be looking at some very geometric material, which aside from a little graphing, we haven't really done geometric stuff this semester. We'll start with the definition of a dot product. So from here on out, unless I tell you otherwise, we are looking at vectors, column vectors in Rn. So the dot product is defined as well, as a product of sorts of two column vectors, but it's different from the multiplication we're used to because the dot product of two vectors isn't a vector, it's a number. So as I say, this is different from what we're used to. I mean, the product of two integers is an integer. The product of two real numbers is a real number. The product of two complex numbers is a complex number. Of two matrices is a matrix. We use the word product here, but this is a pretty fundamental difference from the multiplication we're used to. The way a dot product works, the vectors have to be of the same dimension, first of all. When we take the dot product, we multiply across. So one times zero is zero, two times one is two, three times two is six, zero times negative three is zero. And then we add those numbers together. So this dot product, the dot product of these two vectors is eight. The dot product, in spite of in some ways being very different from the multiplication we're used to, does have some properties that are that are about what we'd expect in at least one way, the dot product is probably more intuitive than, um, than matrix multiplication. The dot product commutes u times v equals v times u. Multiplication, we're used to multiplication distributing over addition, and that is precisely what we have here. We're used from uh, matrix vector multiplication. We're used to moving scalars around. When we have a product, 
and we have all the associativity that we would hope to have from a product. Remember that something's associative if you can move the parentheses around. And this is sort of associativity combined with a commutivity property, but you can move scalars around as well as parentheses. And here's a product a property, I should say, that you might not really think of, but it makes sense that multiplication would have this property based on our experience with the real numbers. The dot product of a vector with itself is greater than or equal to zero. And this is the intuition that a number squared can't be negative. Something times itself shouldn't be negative. Furthermore, I have a greater than or equal to sign here. This is equal to zero if and only if the vector where squaring, as it were, equals the zero vector. So this, uh, this section is a bunch of definitions that kind of build on each other. Now that we have the dot product, we're going to use it to define something else. The norm. So the norm of a vector is written basically like an absolute value, except instead of those one, that one set of vertical lines, we have two vertical lines. And the norm is the square root of the dot product of the vector with itself. And the norm is always defined because of that property down there. We're never taking the square root of a negative number here. And the intuition you ought to have with the norm is that the norm is the length of a vector. Like if you have you is the vector one three and we graph you on the Cartesian plane then if we dropped down this right, this line segment to create a right triangle, one of the sides of the right triangle has length one, the other has length three. Um, this is the length of the vector and the Pythagorean theorem says that the length squared, the hypotenuse squared is one squared plus three squared. So the length 
is the square root of one squared plus three squared. Meanwhile, you adopt you one three dot one three is one times one and three times three added together. It's one squared plus three squared. So this length is indeed the square root of u dot to u. Let's state some properties of the norm. I won't say that that the norm only has three properties, but these three properties are important because they're going to end up being turned into a definition. You remember how we said that vectors have all these properties, a list of eight properties, and then that turned into the definition of a vector space. The same thing is going to happen here. So the first property is that the norm of u plus v is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. This is the famous triangle inequality. The reason this is the triangle inequality is that if you have a vector u, so if you have a vector u, then its length is the norm of u, and you have a vector v, so its length is the norm of v, then here is u plus v. And this is saying that the length of this side plus the length of this side is greater than or equal to the length of this side. It's the sort of, you probably learn this in high school, or at least you do in American high schools, that the length of one side of a triangle cannot be more than the sum of the other sides. This is that statement in a linear algebra context. The, uh, the other statements probably require less comment. The norm of a scalar times u, we can sort of pull that scalar out. And what I mean when I say sort of is that the scalar comes out inside of an absolute value. And this, I mean, if you sort of think, I mean, on the real number line, it's the absolute value that gives the length 
So this is kind of the statement that the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. Finally, we already made this observation when I, wait, what am I doing? Erase. Copying from the wrong list there. If we think of the norm as a length, it makes perfect sense that a length cannot be negative. The norm of any vector is greater than or equal to zero. And just like here, where we then had an additional piece of context, an additional piece of information, the norm of a vector equals zero if and only if the vector is the zero vector. And again, I hope this makes sense just geometrically. I mean, if you think of a vector in R2, it looks like a line segment. Any line segment has a positive length. It's only the zero vector, which is just a dot at the origin that can have a length of zero. From the norm, a few definitions. Definition, a vector is a unit vector if its norm is one. And a sort of sister definition the normalization of a vector. I sort of hate this terminology. I mean, what's it mean in normalization? Every vector, it's just a weird uh, bit, of, bit of terminology, I think. But the normalization is what you get if you take a vector and scale or multiply it by one divided by the norm. It's really more of a unitization because what this is actually doing is taking the vector and giving you a unit vector in the same direction. Remember that scale or multiplication by a constant doesn't change the um, direction of the vector. So we're either expanding or contracting it so that its length is one, but its direction stays the same. This is a very important on set. Um, a lot of times, if you're going to compare vectors in some way, you're going to want to normalize them first. 
And as a concrete example, well, before our concrete example, we're going to want one more definition, and that will be the distance. And this is the distance between vectors. And the distance between two vectors, again, if you think back to the real number line, the distance between two numbers is the absolute value of their difference. So we have something very similar here. The distance between two vectors is the norm of their difference. And this is, if here's a vector u, and here's a vector v, then distance is being measured from tip to tip. So there is the distance between u and v. If u and v are in our two dimensional, so we can graph them on the Cartesian plane. I should point out, um, we're thinking, I'm sort of drawing these pictures in two dimensions. Um, obviously, I haven't said anything about u and v only being two or three dimensional. We can have u and v both be 10 by one vectors. And in that case, we can't really visualize them and we can't really visualize the distance between them, but it's still a defined quantity. Let's give an application of all of this. In spite of my best efforts, linear algebra never has enough applications in it. So let's fix that a little. So this application comes from natural language processing. And our goal here is to look at two I mean, the language doesn't matter. I just want to make it clear that these are not like random strings. These are two or more documents in some language or other. And we want to look at multiple documents and we want to decide how similar they are. And similar could mean a lot of things. It could mean whether the documents are in the same genre. It could mean whether the documents are written during the same decade. It could mean that the documents were written by the same author or that the documents, maybe an author has a student and they write similar stuff because of that lineage. But we're in some ways interested in the similarity between the documents. And we make the observation 
that similar documents should have similar vocabulary. Yeah. So for example, maybe you're interested in genre here. You want to decide whether two documents are in the same genre. So maybe you would think these two documents might be a mystery novels and you look for the through the documents and you make a list of words that you think ought to appear in mystery novels. And you can have as many words in this list as you want. Once you have these list of words, then for each of the documents in a question, you can create a document. To vector where you just count the number of times each word appears. Now, in this example that I've written down, all of those words come from um, sort of one genre. They all come from the mystery genre. Let's look at the situation where we have multiple books and multiple genres. And our goal is to classify the book. And maybe for simplicity, we'll just have two genres, and we'll have two genres that kind of are easy to select words for. I mean, some genres are going to be difficult, like a comedy. If a book is a comedy or not, it's hard to decide, well, what, what word should a comedy use that other genres won't use? So there are limitations to this process. But here we might select murder, alibi, suspect, um, sword, dragon. So some of these words are words that we expect to show up in a mystery novel. 
Others are words that we expect to maybe show up in a fantasy novel. And we can look at our documents And if we get a document that looks like this, a document vector that looks like this, murder appears 27 times, alibi 13, suspect nine, sword one, dragon zero. We say, okay, this is probably of these two genres, this is more likely to be a mystery. And if we see a document vector like this, murder once, alibi zero, suspect two, sword 37, dragon 12, we can say, Okay, well, this is more likely to be a fantasy. Is this clear so far? Then we can ask ourselves how similar the documents are. And we ask this question in a very literal way. How far apart are the document vectors. So, as I say, very literal, just measuring the distance between the vectors. But this, that's, this is not going to work if you don't modify your approach a little. And this is going to demonstrate the value of normalizing vectors before you try to analyze them. Let's look, this is from a kind of classic paper on this subject. Let's look at three phase from Shakespeare. As you like it, Twelfth Night and Henry the Fifth. And to be clear, because I don't know how up you are on your Shakespeare, as you like it and Twelfth Night Dark Comedy. Is Henry V is a history, and like pretty much all of Shakespeare's histories, it is a history with a martial theme to it. Um, battles, um, warring. Payments to the throne, etc. So we're going to try to create document vectors 
that that act the differences in the vocabulary between these plays. And we're going to select battle and soldier as words that we think might appear in Shakespeare's histories. And we're going to select fool and clown as words that we think might appear in more comedic phase. And to create a document vector, we just go through each of these plays in turn, and we count the number of times each of these words shows up. So for as you will like it, Battle once, soldier twice, fool 37 times, found five times. Four, 12th night. Very similar distribution. Um, as far as these martial terms go, in fact, identical distribution. Battle once, soldier twice, fool 58 times, found appears a lot in Twelfth Night. 117 times. Finally, Henry V. So this is our martial history. We'd expect battle and soldier to appear significantly more often in this play, as indeed they do. Fool appears five times, Bown appears zero times. So just looking at these vectors, we're seeing what we would expect to see. Right? I mean, we're seeing the comedy words show up a lot in the comedies, and we're seeing the war words show up a lot in the war thing. And of course, there's some overlap. Um, fool gets used as an insult in Henry V. There are some passing references to battle and to soldier in the comedies. But basically, we're seeing what we expect to see. The problem comes when we ask the question, so are the comedies so Twelfth Night, and as you like it, more similar to each other than for example, the comedy as you would like it is to the military history. 
Henry V. I mean, that's the idea behind this document vector process, or it's one of the ideas behind it, that similar plays will physic or similar documents will be physically closer to each other than documents in different genres. But somehow it doesn't work out here. When we look at how far, as you like it, is from a 12th night, so how far the two comedies are from each other, the distance is about 114. When you look at the difference between as you like it and Henry the Fifth, so how far one of the comedies is from the history, you get a smaller number. So the comedy as you like it is closer to the history, Henry V, than it is to the other comedy, Twelfth Night. What's going on here? Well, I already mentioned norms, so I sort of given away the answer. The issue we're running into here is that one of these document vectors is markedly longer than either of the other document vectors. Two of the document vectors are in the 37 to 39 range. What am I writing? That was supposed to be. Um, the document vector for Henry V. The document vector for Twelfth Night is nowhere close to that. 130, 131 in that range. And we remember. Come on there. We remember how this length works. It's literally just the distance between the tips of the vectors. So if we have two vectors of about the same size, and then we have a third vector, that's way bigger than them. Well, of course, the distance between the smaller vectors is going to be less than the distance between one of the smaller vectors and one of the bigger vectors. That makes perfect sense. So if we're going to use the distance to compare these vectors, we cannot have them be of these radically different sizes. Go back to a normalization which tells us how to take a vector and modify it so that its length is exactly one. This normalization process solves the problem that we're running in 
to wishy here. So if we normalize these vectors, so take as you like it, don't change its direction, but make its length one. We then get a new document vector. And we can do the same for Twelfth Night. And we can do the same for Henry the Fifth. I mean, they're in my notes. I don't know if the details, well, I guess at this point, it's like a minute to write these down, 0 0.007, 0 0.015, 0 0.44, Point ninety, point three eight, point nine two, point thirteen, zero. And now that we have these normalized vectors, um, this issue is resolved. The distance between as you like it, let me put a tilde above it to indicate that we've normalized this. The distance between as you like it normalized and 12th night normalized is about 0.947. The distance between as you like it normalized and Henry V normalized is about 1.28. So now you have what you would expect to have, that your comedies are closer to each other than to a place in a different genre. And this then gets back to what I said earlier, that, I mean, normalizing vectors shows up in a lot of applications. If your vectors are not of about the same size, it's going to be almost impossible to compare them meaning. Theme, at least using the techniques of this chapter. Any questions thus far? Then this chapter contains a lot of definitions, a further major definition. is orthogonality. Yeah. So we say that two vectors, V and W, are orthogonal. If and only if their dot product is zero. And the intuition you should be having here is that 
these two vectors are meeting at a right angle. So for example, the vector three is zero and the vector zero one. In the Cartesian plane, here is three zero. Here is zero one. Three zero lies along the x axis, zero one lies along the y axis. These vectors are meeting at a right angle in the Cartesian plane, which, according to the intuition I've suggested we should have, ought to mean that they're orthogonal. And if you compute the dot product, three zero dot zero one, well, three times zero is zero, zero times one is zero, zero plus zero is zero. These vectors are indeed orthogonal to each other. On the other hand, something like um, one, one, and uh, two negative one. These vectors are not meeting at the right angle on the plane. So, so the, our intuition tells us these ought not to be orthogonal. If you do the math, one, one, dot, Two negative one. One times two is two. One times negative one is negative one. Add them, we do not get zero, so they're not orthogonal. And really, for our purposes, orthogonality is is all we really want in general. Are two vectors at a right angle or aren't they? We should probably at least to see the angle formed of a, even if, as I've said, it's not not one of the most important things in the class. Um, the angle form to the says that u dot to v equals the norm of u times the norm of v times the cosine of theta. And from this, by the way, we can see um, our intuition that if vectors are normal, they meet at a right angle. Um, here is theta on the unit circle. I mean, here is 90 degrees, pi over two radians. On, the, on this point on the unit circle is zero, one. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So if these angles are meeting at nine degrees, 
something times something times zero is a zero, and the dot product is a zero. You could use this definition to define the angle between two vectors. Like if instead of two dimensional space, we're in five dimensional space, what does it mean to talk about vectors meeting at an angle? It's not clear geometrically, but in five-dimensional space, you've still got u dot v, and you've still got these norms, so you can use the cosine of theta to define the angle between any vectors, whether we can visualize them or not. Zoom has had enough of that. Uh, 20 frames is the limit for whatever reason. We're almost done here anyway. The Pythagorean Theorem, uh, something we're all familiar with, says that if U and V are orthogonal, then U plus V that norm squared is the norm of U squared plus ah, the norm of V squared. And again, in two dimensional space, so this is just the Pythagorean theorem. If U and V are orthogonal, then they meet at a right angle. U plus V is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And this thing that I'm calling the Pythagorean theorem is the Pythagorean theorem that we all learn as children. Um, this is actually an if and only if statement. If this equality holds, U and V are orthogonal. And that's true with the normal Pythagorean theorem as well. If you have an, a triangle that is not a right triangle, it does not satisfy the Pythagorean theorem. This side squared plus this side squared is not this side squared. Any questions so far? Sort of a weird section. I mean, it throws a lot of material at you, but also I think it's easier material than the stuff we've been doing. So maybe it kind of evens out. Definition, let W be a subspace of R and 
a vector is orthogonal to W. We've defined a vector being orthogonal to another vector. Now we'll define a vector being orthogonal to W. If that vector is orthogonal to every vector in W. So let me see my ability to, to draw in three dimensions is not what it could be, but the classic example of this would be, and I totally forget in three dimensions, which axis is which, I'm just going to call them X, Y, Z. So a subspace in the three dimensional space, an example of a subspace would be the X, Y plane, all the points where the Z coordinate is a zero. And the vectors orthogonal to this subspace are the ones that are hitting the xy plane at a right angle. That gives us the following definition. So given a subspace W, the orthogonal complement complement of W is the set of all the vectors orthogonal to W. So if W is this XY plane, then this vector is in the orthogonal complement. Any vector that hits this plane at a right angle is in its orthogonal complement. The orthogonal complement gets its own bit of notation the space W, and then in the superscript, the right angle symbol. Again, driving home the intuition we should have that vectors are orthogonal if they meet at a right angle. That's, let me see. Let's power through, I guess. Theorem. If W is a subspace, so is the orthogonal complement of W.
Why don't I actually, um, since I have this example, why don't I work with it a little? So here W is all of the points in the X, Y plane. So W is all of the points where X is whatever and Y is whatever, but the third coordinate is zero. What about W complement? Well, it's any vector um, X1, Y1, Z1 such that this dot product, let me, such that this dot product is always Zero. I've underlined always. It's not enough for this vector to be orthogonal to one vector in W or to be orthogonal to 20 vectors in W. It has to be orthogonal to every vector in W. And the only way to do this, to ensure that this is always zero, is to make those first two components zero. If those first two components are zero, the dot product is zero plus zero, plus zero, the dot product is always zero. So the orthogonal complement of W is all of the vectors that look like that. And W is a subspace. It, the zero vector is in there. It's closed under addition. It's closed under scalar multiplication. That thing that this theorem says ought to be a subspace, the orthogonal complement, it is a subspace. Closed under addition, closed under scale or multiplication, the zero vector is there, just that Z be zero. So there's, I guess, our first concrete example. And I think that takes us about to the end of class. So we will end this.